You're listening to Got Tech, the podcast with your hosts, Eric Geis and Nick Johnson. Welcome back to Got Tech, the podcast. This is episode number 36 called 11 Updates from our favorite ed tech tools at ISTE. We are live here at ISTE and we are happy to bring you these new improvements to our favorite tools. everybody welcome back to got tech the podcast this is episode number 36 and we are live at isd 2019 nick how's it going it's going really good really extremely exciting to have visited with the isd conference for got tech this is our first time doing that and we couldn't be more happy with how it went it's so exciting to be around uh, so much of the exciting ed tech that's happening today with so many of the companies that we talk about all the time and that so many of you guys are interested in and you get to actually meet those people and see what's going on and actually talk to a lot of the developers. One of the parts that I thought was the coolest is not only hearing from them, but sort of getting the chance to give them ideas too. And everybody's always so welcoming from that. So I think for me, guys, it was just an awesome experience so far. Yeah, I mean, we've gone to several other conferences before, but this is by far the largest conference we went to. We went into the expo hall and it took us almost a day and a half of going in there for a good chunk of our day. Uh, we, would, we would get up, we would go to a couple of the sessions, we'd go into the expo hall, we'd come out, grab lunch, go back into the expo hall, go to a session, go back to the expo hall, and really, you get to see every everything that is new and the latest, the greatest. There's a startup company area that you get to take a look at, see if it's something that you want to invest time and research and bringing that back to your classroom. But yeah, the, the conversations that we had with people, our goal wasn't to go and get sound bites. Our goal wasn't to go and, and sell Got Tech. Our goal was to go and find out more so we could bring it back to our listeners and help them implement it. And this is a perfect time because it is the summer. So I think today what we want to do is we just want to share share some of our takeaways from ISTE 2019. Yeah, that's right. So we, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today, we've put together a pretty awesome list from a lot of the ed tech tools that you've probably heard of before. Some of them probably have used before, but the reason we're bringing them up today is like I said, just because they have some really new and exciting features, uh, stuff that was uh, either unveiled recently to the world or some of these actually unveiled literally during the ISTE conference. So we're excited to report some of those back to you guys and I'll kick it off with uh, Flipgrid. Everybody's talking about Flipgrid fever and has been for the past couple of years now, but they've, they're coming out with some really exciting new things. Uh, we were lucky enough to attend a big Flipgrid event a couple nights ago, which was just so cool to kind of see all their whole team and see how excited they are about some of these changes. So the first one I'll kick it off with, uh, and as far as Flipgrid updates, is something they're adding called Shorts. Uh, Shorts is sort of like a new video option for when your students are recording things through Flipgrid. I think the best way to describe it for at least if you are an Instagram user is it kind of feels like Instagram stories uh, in terms of length of the videos, in terms of uh, the way that the videos can be edited with filters, they have little emojis that you can drag out over top of the video to personalize it, little text bubbles and boxes that you can add, and it really makes the Flipgrid video more personalized. And I think they're trying to replicate some of that feel of the social media apps that's, you know, obviously everybody loves to use and sort of building that in. They showed us some of the examples of these short videos that could be made with their new Flipgrid short camera. And it was just so cool. And it looks like the kids could have so much fun with it while, of course, in this sort of context of the Flipgrid app, which is really exciting. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. But the one thing that I really like is the fact that all the tools that they need to make it interactive to, to make their little short look nice professional and kind of like a little movie bite almost is right there and uh, it does not take up the whole window so if if I'm recording a video you could still see me it's not like I'm recording over my face with a banner 
or an emoji or anything like that, there's plenty of room. They enlarge the screen so when they record, everything makes sense. And they did a really nice job with it. So another thing for me personally that was so, so amazing and probably the one single reason that I will start to use Flipgrid more in my class is an automatic whiteboard editor that you can incorporate into a video that you record with their new shorts camera. What that means is if you're a student recording with the shorts camera, you can flip over to this whiteboard edi editor, which turns your screen into a whiteboard. And you can use your finger to write and talk over top of that. Now, as a chemistry teacher, kind of my biggest, the biggest reason I haven't used Flipgrid is because so much of my class is math and writing down and then describing the math that you're doing and connecting that to phenomena that you see in the real world. And I know that's going to be for a lot of different subjects. Uh, but now envisioning that I can ask my students to not only solve a problem, which I do every day, but solve that problem. I can see it in the video and hear them describe what they're doing in each step of the solving process and then push all those push all those videos to one of my uh, Flipgrid pages is so, so cool. Uh, and they can go back and forth between the whiteboard editor and their, you know, they're recording their face with the webcam feature as many times as they want. Uh, this is just going to be incredible for me. And like I said, it's pretty much the sole reason that I'm going to start to use this a lot more in my class. And adding on to that, there's just like simple editing stuff. If there's multiple video snippets that are taken with the shorts camera, you can really easily kind of drag and drop those, put them up next to one another to make one uh, longer video within this Flipgrid platform. So those are a couple more of my favorite Flipgrid features. Another thing that I like is they partnered up with Wakelet. They went away to make resources available within their Flipgrid, which is amazing. So Wakelet, you know, that's an ed tech tool that allows you to make collections of resources and it allows you to share these resources. So what they did is they partnered with them. So now students can bring those resources in to Flipgrid and they can make comments about them and it's easily a accessible for students. I think that's a game changer as well. Yeah, the, the Wakelet integration seems really, really cool. Uh, another one that kind of caught our eye with, that Flipgrid is doing is something called PALS. And you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the PALS feature is sort of pairing up teachers using the feature with other teachers from around the world and making you almost like a Flipgrid PAL so that you can collaborate and talk to and build Flipgrid boards with your connect, whatever other teacher. It could literally be somebody across the world who that they have connected you with as, as your pal. Yeah, I mean, pals have been around for a while. But the, the ease of use in the, the way to connect with people used to be through social media. And the, the new thing is the email. And we were sitting right next to our good buddy, uh, Kyle Nemus, and he was excited about that because he's used Flipgrid Pals. And he said, having the email there solves everything. So I know he was excited and that made me excited about it. So I thought that was also a very cool feature. Uh, but the one I want to talk about is I think it's a game changer for our special education students. And that's the fact that, you know, Microsoft, I, I give them credit. They, uh, they want to make all their products and anybody that wants to partner up with them, they, they want to give them an immersive reader, which allows everything to be translated for ESL students, or it's just going to help everybody that needs that extra bit of help, and it's going to level the playing field. So I think that is pretty on par for what we need to keep doing and pushing for in education. The immersive reader was mind-blowing to me. Um, I'm pretty sure a part of that was uh, for each Flipgrid video that's posted, uh, the, uh, the words, the audio from the video is translated scripted and then you know if you're a student who struggles with different aspects of reading uh, this immersive reader that they're calling it in this partnership with Microsoft so many cool things guys mentioned some of them one thing that I thought was really cool is you have the option as a student uh, to click on certain words, certain words that might be confusing become clickable and it, that would then link them to maybe a definition or some other way to understand that word. There's also a line by line reader. So if you have trouble focusing on the whole page at once and maybe you lose your place, it'll kind of automatically black out all the other texts except for just one of those lines and you can kind of thumb down. Uh, there's a couple other aspects to it that we didn't really get a chance to fully investigate. But like I said, this immersive reader, so cool. And they even talked about bringing that same thing to other platforms that students might read from just because of how helpful it could be and from a teacher perspective talk about how easily that differentiates and sort of meets uh, some of the special needs of your students really without doing any extra work it's already built into the Flipgrid platform for any videos that are made so I just think that was 
Awesome. So the, the last uh, update that they've done is a little bit with the sizing of the videos and how it looks on the grid. They did a lot of simplifications of how to set up the grid and all that, but the look of it has changed a little bit because now all the videos are the same length, same width. It looks very nice. You could reorganize them uh, however you want but there's also a mass action button. And you click on that and it gives you several options. You can uh, hide those videos, you can display those videos, you can download those videos. And that that's also something that makes the tool a little bit easier to use and a little bit more user friendly. And it cuts down on the time that the students need, or the teachers need, I'm sorry, to maybe do something that they wanna do with those videos. Here's something I wanna just add to that. The two things guys just mentioned, the rearranging of the videos. There's also like a randomized feature uh, that you can click to where the students get to view the videos randomly or in whatever order you set as the teacher, which is cool. Uh, but that feature, along with the mass action download, those two things were in direct response to something that one teacher, just one teacher was asking for. Uh, they reached out to the Flipgrid team, kind of talked about it, talked about their need of that and why it might be helpful. And it was done. They integrated that. And I just think it's so cool. And so many of these uh, ed tech groups and ed tech companies are like this. They want to hear from from you guys. They want to know what the needs are because that's literally like free product research for them. And they really, one thing that I, I don't know if you felt this way, but it, you can really tell that a lot of these companies and Flipgrid is one of them. They really just want to make the best service possible to help teachers as much as possible. So please reach out to these guys. They love it. And like I said, they may literally directly do for their product the thing you're asking for. So that was pretty cool. So that, that pretty much closes up our Flipgrid portion. And, and that's a big piece, but I feel like they may make changes all the time but let's go into google and there are so many google updates and changes and they come out all the time so we're just going to pick some of our favorites that we've learned about um and the first one for me is is a game changer i used to have to use a different program to make a bank and kind of what i did is i copied and pasted things off of a google doc or or in from a google sheet and that's where i kept all my questions and then i would just bring them in that took a lot of time but now in google forms you can pull questions from all your other Google Forms and select which ones that you want to bring into Google Forms. Yeah, this was always annoying for me too, because if I was making an, <laughs> a new quiz with Google Forms or a questionnaire, I would just try and find an old one that was most similar to it, but I would have to make a copy of the whole document and then delete questions. And like you said, just kind of like retype in questions that I wanted in there from other quizzes that I've put together. But now, like you said, you can sort of copy paste those directly. So it's a simple thing, but I think that'll fill a big need for teachers. Another one that we kind of thought was neat from Google is their Google Expedition feature. Uh, which this summer is going to now be available on Chromebooks, which is amazing because, of course, a lot of schools are using Chromebooks for their one-to-one -one devices, or maybe you've got Chromebook carts for your kids to use. So anybody that's figured out a way to use Google Expedition in the class and it's been a struggle with the Chromebooks, definitely check that out uh, because Google Expedition is super cool. Also, just check out Google Expedition if you haven't seen it yet. It's a really, really fun thing. The, the next one is called Chromebook App Hub, and Chromebook App Hub is a collection of ideas brought by students, educators. Uh, I guess anyone could submit this. I guess they're looking more for the teacher side, or the educator side, but it's a bunch of lessons. And what they do is they kind of showcase what G Suite for Education products they use, how they use it, and they give examples uh, of the uses of the different G Suite products. Yeah, it's, it looks like a really amazing tool, and I'm, I think what they're trying to do with the Chromebook App Hub is sort of pull together uh, almost like lessons or curated things that teachers have put together. So when you go there uh, to the Chromebook App Hub, and you can just search this and find it pretty easily on Google, there's a bunch of categories that allow you to filter. Some of them are, they call it the idea category, which is just a certain idea you want to pursue for a lesson in your class. You can filter by the age range of students you're teaching, and there's tons of options, subject, learning goal even. These are all different. Uh, search versions and you just get this whole little window of populated things and you can click on any one of them and you'll see when you click on one of these that it's all put together by teachers tech integration coaches from across the country um, and it just kind of is is almost like a lesson with these curated resources that a teacher can follow it's got tips for success it's got resources to get you started that contain a bunch of uh, YouTube videos all pulled into one place um, it's got apps 
that you can use if you want to use this idea in your class. So it'll list out well, whatever app you would need for this idea or this lesson, and, and then directions on how to set it up and how to integrate that into your class. Such a cool thing, even if you just need some inspiration, check out the Chromebook App Hub, go to whatever subject you teach, and just start clicking on stuff until you see what's there. I think the real plan behind this is now there's so many different things. There's apps, extensions, add-ons, other sort of programs that you download directly. Uh, there's YouTube videos and they're all over the place. But with the Chromebook App Hub, it's kind of pulling them into one central location so that it's all there and you can just click within one page rather than having up a tab uh, on, you know, on the Chrome store where you can download the extension you need, a tab for for three different tabs for three different YouTube videos. It's literally all here and curated for you as, as a teacher looking to incorporate some ideas into your class. One of the things that really sticks out to me is the fact that you actually have to fill out an application to put something on there. And that in itself is going to filter out some of the ones that might not be the best fit or might not be an actual best practice and it's going to eliminate the clutter. I wonder sometime if uh, you know Google is going to come in and have a way to vote or put a like button there or that way we can also kind of see which ones that are most used or the best uh, resources on this platform and have them be able to be voted up or maybe even taken off if they're not really as good as is what they were intended to be or if they're not serving the purpose that needs teachers but this is an amazing resource we just went on there for a couple minutes the other day after we heard about uh the hub and we were like wow that's a great idea that's a great idea i could do that with that i didn't think of that and you know it just allows us to expand as educators Here's a more specific example just to give every a better, uh, everybody a better sense of this. I just clicked on the first one I saw at the top of the screen. It's called From Screencastify to Edpuzzle, Make Your Instructional Videos Interactive. This was contributed by an uh, EdTech consultant from Ohio. So again, just a regular person that submitted this application. Uh, beneath, When you click on it beneath that, there's a little overview, just a really brief, quick paragraph to kind of give you a sense of what this idea is going to contain. Then beneath that, there's some tips. The tips include just little quick bulleted points about sort of how to pick the content for your video, what content works well for videos, tips about using the webcam feature, tips about how to actually do the uploading process. So that's something that slows a lot of people down is feeling like you don't know how to do any of these things. Well, that's contained in this. There's differentiation strategies there for teachers who are making videos. So for your English language, uh, or English as a second language learner, especially accommodations it's all there and then the best part like we said before is these curated resources everything from YouTube videos to the exact Chrome extensions you'll need to make the videos it's all there all in one place so you even have some things like this that aren't really for creating a specific lesson but just general help for teachers on something they may want to do so I can see this Chromebook app hub going big places so let's get into our next one it's not new but they're making improvements to it and I just want to throw a shout out there because this was one of my favorite TV shows growing up. I remember getting off the bus, maybe in middle school, elementary school, and coming in and it was actually one of the TV shows that was on one of the five channels that we got. I, li I was a country uh, kid and our satellite dish was like, I don't know, 12 by 12 like circle in our backyard. I used to go out and throw uh, like rubber balls off of it. It was so huge and it would come back to me and I would feel it practicing baseball. So having this type of a, a TV show was a pretty much uh, a great thing for me. Uh, I didn't watch a whole lot of TV, but do you remember Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? Yeah, I also loved it. I thought that was just the greatest thing ever. Yeah, I mean, I was probably a little old to watch it and I still watched it. And you know what? If it was on today, I'd still watch it. I'd watch it right now. I watched a rerun with my kids <laughs> and they aren't even old enough to understand it. But uh, Google Earth is updated. Where in the world is Car Carmen San Diego? Bringing you more opportunity for that. So just go out and check it out. I don't think we need to go into it any more than that. If you know what Where in the World is Carmen San Diego is, you're going to love it. So let's get into one of our favorite ed tech tools, period. Yeah, this was really exciting for me. If you listen to the show, you've 
almost definitely heard me talk about my favorite video recording and editing, really screencast uh, recording uh, feature, which is Screencast-O-Matic. And we got to actually meet and talk to some of the people from Screencast-O-Matic at the ISTE conference, which was so cool. And like I said, the best part about it, besides actually talking to them and sharing ideas, which they love to hear, is hearing about what's coming up and what's new. So for Screencast-O-Matic, really awesome that they uh, are being accepted onto the Chrome store, which is going to make it so much easier to use that product, which I think is already the easiest to use video editor out there and definitely my favorite one. Uh, and now it just got a whole lot easier. Yeah, I mean, we, we keep talking about screencast recorders. And the reason why we bring different ones to the table is because, you know, everyone likes what they like. And there could be another one that offers something different. But I am telling you, from being a user of the Premier Edition, which doesn't cost you a lot, I mean, it might be a little over a bucket a month. And for it, that isn't a lot. No. But the editing tools within Screencast-O-Matic are superior to any other screencasting tool. You know, you could do everything that you could do with everything else, but the editing is fantastic. I have never had a problem. I could push out a flipped classroom video that is, I record it for 10 minutes and it's done. You know, I go back, I edit it something, I put a little intro in there, my, my standardized intro. I could do all that and be done with the video, a 10 minute video in under 20 minutes. And that's edited, that's adding certain things, inserting maybe a slide that I forgot. It's just amazing. And I do not understand when we go to conferences and stuff, why we hear some others over this one. Yeah just doesn't make sense to me. I don't get it either, but there are, I mean, Screencastify, a lot of people like that is their favorite one. A lot of this is very personal, so we, we get that. But yeah, I, th I just think with, with Screencast-O-Matic, you can make a professional quality video, literally two clicks, one to start recording, one to stop, and you're done. Now, if you get into it, of course, there's a lot more time you can spend in ways to enhance that, but that's my favorite part. And like I said, now that they're uh, available in the Chrome store, just got that much easier. So big shout out to Screencast-O-Matic and the, and the team over there. Uh, another one which is kind of cool that we actually probably don't bring up that much. So it was exciting to see some new things for the uh, for this team. That's uh, Adobe Spark now has a collaboration option, kind of seeing what's happening with Google and now Microsoft getting more into the collaboration game because that works so well for the education space uh, we're seeing Adobe Spark is going to open that up for teachers and students also which is great uh, obviously we don't need to tell you guys about the benefits of collaboration for classroom and classroom projects but to know that you can do that with uh, within Adobe now is uh, also really really cool so let's go into formative assessment tools we could talk about GimKit a little bit here the creators of GimKit were here they had their purple shirts um, very energetic guys I don't know if you saw the the video of him packing, but I thought it was yeah. hilarious. That was really funny. You know, he's packing all these types of teas because that is tea, and he's packing a t-shirt because right. that is tea. And he left his long sleeve shirt at home, which is probably a good thing because it's been very hot this week. Yeah, yeah, the humidity came back in too, which is kind of a bummer, but. So GimKit's offering a lot of updates as well. They're, they're making a gamification tool even more gamified and I, I heard that they have some improvements coming in the feedback arena or spectrum of that tool so keep an eye out for that uh, and another one that we heard have several changes is Kahoot now yeah these are competitors in the same space but they're two quality tools right? and there are others in this space and they all have things that make them unique but let's talk a little bit about the Kahoot updates for example this is a small change but I think this is a big change they made more uh, room for the question on the interface what's the most important thing when you're taking a formative assessment it's the question so now they they made more room which uh, I think that's a good thing because once again making things easier to read more accessible i think that's a big part of education agreed and uh, kahoot is an awesome tool but one of the knocks that i've heard certain people say on it is that the time element was too short and for a lot of students i was i was one of these kids as soon as i see that there's a time and if especially if it's a minute something short like that even if i can answer the question the time it just messes with my head and i and i can't i can't do it i slow down i start bouncing all over the place so i think sort of in response to that critique who has extended their timer so now it can be four minutes so you keep some of that time element because of course they're built in the sort of game style platform so i think the time is 
important for what Kahoot is, but I do like the option to extend it to that four minute time just for some kids that might, you know, the, where previously the time element might have prevented them from actually being able to uh, listen and pay attention and learn at their optimum level uh, because of that. So I think that's an awesome uh, change. Yeah, I, I was working with one of our teachers at our high school at the end of the year, and we actually chose a different assessment tool because she was doing genetics problems. She was having students write out the whole entire test cross, and that takes time, but that's how she wanted to do it. And I think Kahoot just, you know, stepped up and said, okay, we hear you teachers, here you go. We're gonna expand it to four four minutes. And I bet you if there's a need to make it longer, and they heard that, they would probably change because, you know, some of these companies are chameleons. You know, they're able to get people working for them and quickly to update these things because they know that teachers need a specific thing and they need to to work on it quickly in order to make it relevant and I think Flipgrid and Kahoot and all these Google um, platforms and you know basically everyone that we're talking about today are doing a nice job of that so two more things on Kahoot first is you're able to reorganize the questions it's a drag and drop feature allows you to reorganize the questions but the other thing is is they now have autosave so if you're working in a place that keeps bouncing in and out of Wi-Fi and you're working on a quiz, you're no longer losing that work. It's auto-saving. It will be there as a draft. And that's amazing. Super huge. Yeah, I love the auto-save feature. Kind of, again, stealing ideas from uh, other places like the Google Docs that are saving all the time. And so many things do that now. And Kahoot's jumping on board as well. This last one, besides, for me at least, for besides getting to talk to Screencast-O-Matic, getting to talk to the team from uh, Text Help was so, so cool. If you don't know Text Help, they have a couple different things. One of them is a, another one that we talk about all the time on the show. And that is, of course, Equasio. I actually got to talk to the person that developed Equasio itself, which was so amazing. And he actually showed me some features that I didn't even know that it had. Equasio, if you're not familiar, lets you sort of type uh, equations and math and all sorts of other things. As a chemistry teacher, uh, there's all sorts of ways to really simply type uh, like isotopic notations for anybody that knows that, which is such a pain because there's like a subscript and a superscript stacked on top of each other. It's a nightmare. They kind of make that super easy and build it right in. You uh, can do that. Yeah, man. I didn't even know. I didn't know that either. I thought so it's more like exponents and, and things like that. That is amazing. It's amazing. And that wasn't new. That's been around. I just didn't know it, which is crazy. And again, he told me that that was in direct response to one chemistry teacher that asked for it, even though we've all been thinking it. One chem teacher asked for it. They responded. They even named the feature after her, which I thought was super cool. The little initials of the feature are the initials of the woman who asked for this, which I think is a nice little nod. A couple things that they're updating in Equasio. One is minor, but I'm a big fan of this. And that is when you uh, edit and add an equation, you can change the color. So added a couple different color options, which is pretty neat. A huge one for Equasio is they're gonna very soon be incorporating with Microsoft products as well. And if you use the Equasio in the Microsoft product, when you transfer back and forth, say from a Word document into a Google document, uh, the equation won't get messed up because that when you switch back and forth of course between those two platforms any equations that you've got that are typed into one kind of get screwed up in the other and they're going to make that much more seamless now between those two platforms which i think is super huge so for me like i said talking to the equasio people and hearing a little bit about their updates was super exciting and also for text help they've got a couple other things and one of them uh, guys is going to tell you about it's called ryq which we did I think mention on a recent show, but there's some really cool stuff happening there too. Yeah, I'm gonna back up a little bit because I I also talked to a representative of Text Help. Uh, it was actually the Jersey, Pennsylvania representative. We had a great conversation. He was a very nice guy, and he's like, yeah, you know what? If you want to implement this stuff, reach out to us. We'll set it up. You know set it up for you so we can integrate it in the fall with your teachers and to me i was like that's awesome i mean i would invite these guys out anytime because i was telling them the story of some of our uh, our math and science teachers you know were sometimes hesitant to take on certain tools and equasio is an amazing tool and i actually told them how i had talked with some of our math teachers and this isn't just at the high school this is at the middle school and even some elementary teachers i challenge them i give them five equations 
on a piece of paper and I have the same five equations and I'll be like if you enter these five equations the way that you do it before I enter five equations in the way I do it you know I'll buy you lunch I've done this several times and no one's beat me I mean sometimes I even go over and I'll be like hey you could you could get a head start I'm gonna go over here and uh, write a text to my wife real quick I'll be back I'll come back and I'll be like hey are you done because I'm done uh, let me know when you're finished or something like that and they'd, they'd be like well how'd you do that so quick and then guess what they're hooked they're in and uh, I think that is a great way to challenge people it, it kind of gamifies learning a tool or, or getting them interested in learning a tool but let's talk about RIQ that's W-R-I-Q and yes we did bring this up as one of our 50 student-centered applications or Chrome extensions uh, in a previous episode but RIQ is amazing for anyone that asks students to turn in a writing assignment. What it's going to do is it's going to, the students turn in the writing assignment and it's going to correct the grammar, the spelling and all that and it's going to identify that but it's also going to score. It's going to say these are how many uh, grammar mistakes, spelling mistakes, that type of thing. So that takes all that time that you had to do that out of it. But then they also have rubrics built in and the rubrics are amazing. It's very simple. They're their traditional rubrics that they have right now are at grade level, below grade level, or there's one other category. I think it might be advanced yeah. or, or exceptional or something like that. And then uh, they're coming out by fall. They're coming out with uh, you guys are able to make your own rubrics. And I think that's huge. So if there are seven writing skills, you could put those in there. But for me as a science teacher, and I know you could relate, I'm making students do a formal lab write-up or claims evidence reasoning write-up, I no longer have to do that uh, grammar check. I'm just going to be responsible for the content and making sure that content fits the standards that I put forth there or, you know, the the new rubric that I made within there. And I think that is huge. Yeah. And for any of the teachers that have sort of felt left out in the automatic grading world, and that's going to be those of us who do writing with our students, which should be everybody, uh, English teachers especially, but even as a chemistry teacher, my students write all the time. There's no way to automate that. And there still is not because, of course, you need the human element to read it and sort of decide what the student was trying to say. But getting closer to that and at least making it faster, something like RIQ, like you said, that just kind of takes away the grammar, the spelling, all that's done automatically. So it is the teacher. You just have to read it for hopefully what you actually want to read it for, which is the, you know, the, the content and what they're saying and how they're saying it. Think about teaching. It's data driven. It should be data driven. We want to make sure that our students are improving. And to me, I would rather them improve individually than, you know, I'd rather compare individual scores. So you five months ago to you present day, and now you can do that. This is basically a tool that's going to allow you to finish your SGO very, very quickly. If you're uh, an English teacher, think about it. If you want students to improve on grammatical errors, you give them an assignment, they hand it in, you know, little Johnny got 53% grammatical correctness right? and you want him to improve on that by the end of the year they do a similar assignment you know he's down to 16 percent well guess what you just proved that little johnny has improved because of your instruction over the course of the year and that right there my friend is saving teachers time and that's what we are all about we're, we're trying to take all the guesswork all the research that that teachers have to do going out researching the app researching the ed tech tools we we do that for you and then we bring you some practical ways of in, incorporating it into the classroom and uh if anything at ISTE, we we've strengthened that focus for our our show our our episodes we want to make sure that we're giving you the best tools out there possible and that we are explaining ways that you could use those into the classroom Thanks for listening to Got Tech, the podcast. Remember to subscribe to our show and follow us at We Got Tech on Twitter so you can stay up to date with the latest episode releases, blog posts, product reviews, and PD announcements. You can also follow Geis and I individually at Geis Got Tech and at Nick Got Tech on Twitter or on Instagram at Nick Got Tech. Finally, remember to check out our website, gottech.com, where we post all our episodes, articles, and resources available to you for free. Until next time.